In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Reformation is relevant to us as much more than just a day to remember some historical events. That is because the core problem brought up during the Reformation was not new. The error made, which Luther and the many reformers spoke against, was not unique to the 1500s. In fact, it was one of the first errors which took place in the church after that very first Pentecost, and it still remains today. If we were to break down this error into its most digestible form, it would be this. People sought to add something to Jesus in order to equal salvation. Think of it like a math equation. Jesus plus fill in the blank equals salvation. For Luther's time, there were numerous things that people erroneously sought to fill in that blank with. We can think of papal indulgences, the authority of the Pope, or the demand for good works. These are the things that our Lutheran confessions clearly speak against as requirements for being justified, that is, being made righteous and saved, we abide to the confession that nothing should be added to Jesus' work in order for us to be saved. Going back further to, as was said, the apostles' time, we see from the scriptures that the reformers weren't the first to have to fight against people trying to add something to Jesus. Our epistle reading is proof of this. St. Paul wrote, By the works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight. No human works can justify you. They cannot save you. 1,500 years before Luther, St. Paul here in Romans had to speak against something very similar to what Luther spoke against. Romans 3 continues, But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. That is to say, you cannot be made justified by fulfilling the law. All sin and fall short of its demands. So instead, we are justified by God's grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, received by faith. We receive the gift of salvation through faith. We do not earn it as a payment. Jesus earned it. He worked for it. And he gives it as a gift to all those who trust in him. The last verse of the epistle says, for we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Our keeping of the Ten Commandments, the, our keeping of the law, and any good we do for anyone are not the reason we are saved. We do not dare say Jesus plus good works equals salvation. Remember, though, we are looking at the error of the equation itself. The equation and the attempt to fill in the blank is what is most relevant to us. Mentioned so far has been good works, papal indulgences, the authority of the Pope, but we see the equation come up again in the book of Acts, this time with a different thing to fill in that blank with. Reading through the book of Acts, as we have been in Bible study, you would have heard of the early Christians attempting to add circumcision. This was the first great error of the church in which it had to be settled. Do the uncircumcised Gentiles who convert to Christianity have to be circumcised in order to be saved. Every Jew did. What about Christians? The biblical answer was a firm no. Peter also spoke against it, as did Paul and Barnabas and the church in accordance with the scriptures. <clears throat> and the church acted in accordance with the scriptures. Circumcision did not and never will need to be added to Jesus in order to, for someone to be saved. Those who sought to do so were proven wrong by God's word and action itself, and the problem was dealt with. So the error has been identified. Jesus plus fill in the blank equals salvation. And two examples have been mentioned from the scriptures. The relevance, though, 
of the Reformation for us today has yet to be made clear because with what we've looked at so far, it can seem like we're fairly safe from repeating it. No, none of us are at threat of demanding circumcision. And if we see anyone doing so, we could quite easily identify it as wrong and unscriptural. No, we are also, as confessing Lutherans, not at threat of beginning to say we need to earn our salvation by good works, never mind just a Lutheran, but most Christians are likely not going to say that today. And as Lutherans, we expect to be able to identify that kind of error. The relevance, the relevance for us then comes less in those specific examples and more in the error of trying to fill in that blank next to Jesus in that equation. Jesus plus something has never gone away. Sure, circumcision and good works are no longer blatantly thrown in there, but many other things are added. We must think of this not as something that we can easily get over and avoid because we've done so before, but we must think of it as even more dangerous because of how persistent it is among Christians. It was there at the very beginning of the church's history, after that first Pentecost, as we noted in Acts and Romans 3, and it sprung up in such horrible forms in the 1500s, causing a great division among Christians. Woe to us if we slip into it again. Yet it does happen, and we need to be on guard. Emotions are something that tries to jump in. Emotions are a tricky thing to understand. They're subjective, meaning one person can feel one emotion while someone else feels an entirely different thing. This means they're not tied to the objective truth. Therefore, not all of us will have the same emotion in response to the same thing. Meanwhile, we all have emotions. The way, therefore, that emotions are added to Jesus is by expecting a certain emotion in response to the gospel. Many Christians can get caught up in this. Do you feel that God has saved you? Can you tell by a feeling in your heart? Do you feel like this is the right church to be in? You've likely heard this type of language before. What it does is make someone expect some type of emotional feeling that is proof that you're saved or that you're in the right place. Thus, when you don't feel how you should, or would expect to feel, you begin to doubt. This is one of the big differences between Lutherans and other Protestants, especially the big box churches that exist today. Think of the churches that look nothing like ours. Think of the ones with big stages up front, loud music, a band jumping around, perhaps a young and extremely energetic pastor that sounds like he's trying to pump you up before a sports match. Now, your first reaction to those types of churches might be that you wouldn't feel right in them, but that is not the reason that they should be avoided. First, what are they trying to do with all those flashy, exciting things? They're trying to get you into the right feeling. Wouldn't you question what you were missing if you were to attend one of those churches and not feel as excited and happy as all those around you? Not that feeling excited and happy for church are wrong, but it puts pressure on you to feel those ways. It puts pressure on you to have the right emotion, making Jesus plus emotion a thing. Meanwhile, the reality is that whatever you feel inside does not determine the truth of what is being spoken. God's word is greater than what you feel. Unlike emotions, which change and adapt, God's word always stays the same. The 11 disciples, terrified after Jesus was killed on the cross, hid for fear of the Jews. They thought they would be next. Yet Jesus had said that he must suffer and die and on the third day be raised. Even though they all felt fear, it didn't change what Jesus had promised. Jesus still died for their sins. He still rose and he still sent them to spread the gospel to you. So if you're nervous about your sins, God still loves you. If 
you feel too sad or out of it, Jesus still died for you. If you're just not feeling it one Sunday morning, the proclamation of the gospel is still true. All that God has done is true because he has promised it and your emotions can't change that. Don't let the unbiblical expectation that you should feel happy all the time as a Christian tear the assurance of your salvation apart. This is what adding emotion into the blank does. It makes you question why you haven't got the right emotion or why you aren't feeling as good as everyone else seems. It makes the Christian life tied to a life of being joyful and happy. But that is not what we are promised as Christians. We're promised suffering and persecution. First Peter says, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. We are to expect hardship and nobody expects to feel good while enduring a fiery trial. That is because feelings are not the point. We are to cling to the truth, not our emotion. We are to cling to God and no other. The joy Christians are promised will be fully experienced in heaven. So let us not put that burden on ourselves now. Let us not make emotion a thing required in addition to Jesus for us to know we are saved. This is important to identify as a thing we may try to add to Jesus because as we look around today, we do not see a sparkling image of worldly success in our churches. Churches look empty, which can make us feel like we're doing the wrong thing or that we're wasting our time. But Jesus plus a packed church doesn't equal salvation either. Are the, there reasons that we may need to repent of for our church being small? Indeed, there sure are. Those are healthy to think about. Yet even when our sin or the world or anything else makes us look low in the world, we know that it is not a measure on whether or not we are saved. God's word doesn't become false just because less people believe it. Your faith doesn't become in vain just because others have given up their faith. Jesus doesn't require anything to be added to him in order for your salvation to be true. He's great enough to save us on his own. If math isn't your thing, the other way to think of this is as a chain. By Jesus' death and resurrection, he has made a chain. And as long as that chain stays together, your salvation by him is real. If you begin to add in your own chain links like good works, circumcision, emotion, worldly success, you add in weak links. You never have to doubt or worry about the part of the chain that Jesus made, for you know that is certain and true. Thus your focus is put entirely on the part in your control. Jesus' strength and power do not matter if you rely on something weaker as part of that salvation chain. Jesus gets put aside as you think more and more about how you can fix the weak part since Jesus has already done his job. Here, the wicked error of doing such a thing. We have nothing to offer that can make us righteous and deserving of salvation. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All are accountable for all of the laws. Any sin makes us deserving of punishment and only Jesus has made that up for us. Only Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Only he can set us free. By no other name you are saved. The Reformation is relevant as a reminder of how easy it can be for Christians to mess this up. This error of thinking that Jesus needs our help will always be with us. And as you see, can come at you in many different ways. Abide in Jesus' word, though, and you will be able to see the truth, have faith in it, and know the reality of salvation offered to you by the work of none other than the Son of God. In Jesus' name, amen. <coughs> the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.